So um, there's, we're doing it one, one part of today, this is going to be checked with, this was supposed to be given last week. So one of the topics for today is basically how, uh, what the role of sex differentiation is on the development of the brain, the function of the brain, and the nervous system, and what components determine that, what components are uh, flexible and which aren't. Um, it's, it's rather a broad topic, but it's kind of fun to brush up on. So mechanisms, there's a number of different ways that uh, sexual differences uh, in, between individuals can come out and uh, actually affect development and other things. Genotypic sex has a role in modulating anatomy and behavior. Uh, genotypic sex here, I'm going to do definitions again in just one second because it's kind of crucial for the thing. It's basically what chromosomes you have. Phenotypic sex is what you look like, what you want, uh, or which uh, manifestations are present. Um, and, and that's basically defined by anatomy and behavior. Um, hormones have a big role in modulating these things as does the underlying genotype. So it starts to get very intricate. Gene expression also has a role in particular how the gene is processed, what proteins it produces, it can vary on proteins for different sexes. Um, and all these things that come together sort of in terms of the development of the individual and then how uh, the individual expresses those things in relationship to sexual interactions, sexual relationships, and the It's a pretty complicated thing. I'll try to show you some of the highlights. Um, dimorphisms are basically where there's differences between men, men and women, males and females, or two sexes in, say, simpler organisms. And um, the most obvious things are physical characteristics, the genitalia, mem memory glands, hair patterns, st stature, and voice are obvious examples of how uh, the sexes might be different. Uh, some changes are also present in neural systems, particularly in the brain. We'll go into that. That's part of the brain. And to sort of start it out here, uh, there's a bunch of little studies that they've done to try to tease apart what's causing which, which difference in the two sexes in different species. First example case is a moth, the Mandrika sexta. It has some variations in just the antenna. Um, and the antenna for the females are sort of um, simplified in that there's no little brushiness to it. Whereas the male antenna have a lot of uh, extra uh, components to them, little uh, things coming off the antenna that are feel around for pheromones. Um, so the, the purposes that they're used for are a bit different. Males have to find the females, females are found so they don't have to find the males. And so there's a much more functional in that sense. This is just one example of how things can be dimorphic or are variable across the species. Bird song is another example uh, in song, songbirds, particularly I think in finches, where you have uh, some differences between males and females. And uh, the syrinx, which is their sort of the voice box, is a bit different, and that's due to uh, sexual difference going back. Uh, I believe the, um, the male uh, develops uh, extra elaborated syrinx, and if you give the female testosterone or other hormones, you can actually develop along the lines of a male in terms of development and during that process. Here, here's some uh, examples for the moth. Uh, so this is the male. It's a little hard to see. I don't know if I can. Uh, but you see there's a sort of a, a central core, and then there's all these little projections off of it to pick up the pheromones that might be coming from a female somewhere in the area. Females, they don't have to worry about that. So it's much simpler. It's much more of a functional antenna. And then in the actual organ in the brain, 
a male develops a slightly different or additional complex in the sensing organ for the antenna. It's called the macular glomerular complex for the species. Um, and if you attach a male antenna onto a female larva and then let it develop, uh, the female will actually develop the same macular glomerular complex. So it means it's sort of uh, triggered by the presence of the antenna itself rather than by the sex per se of the, the uh, animal. So there's a trophic factor that's going back and presumably from the end organ, which is the antenna, into the brain saying, uh, I have a, a male antenna, create the appropriate circuitry so that I can process the information into it. Uh, okay, so again, chromosome, uh, some definition around Chromosomal sex or genotypic sex, basically chromosomal makeup, which would be XX or XY in humans. Genotypic sex is actual state of sex characteristics, which are the manifestations uh, the people are aware of and are present physically. Um, sexual identity is actually the perception's perception of their sex in another, uh, and what People can't see or appreciate your chromosome. So what we're referring to here is the phenotype. So what you feel your sex is, that's your sexual identity. And then sexual orientation is another issue because it, it's a matter of preference and the emotions involved with sexual relationships. And this may or may not be conjunction with sexual identity. Go together. Determinants for all this, uh, Y chromosome in many animals. Uh, it's a little more complicated than this in insects and other things. Um, the other determinants of uh, sexuality in a broad way would be testes determining factor. In a lot of animals, that seems to be the gene that determines whether the, the individual is a male or a female. And then there's a sex reversal of the Y chromosome gene, which is actually in the same region of um, the chromosome, but I believe it is a separate gene. Um, uh, if, they, if somebody has Y uh, or the gene, in other words, the uh, SRY gene is not functional, then the sort of the default for most uh, species is to be female or double, equivalent of double X. So, that's kind of the default. If there's no stimulation, you push towards the male. This we just go in adult development in, uh, I guess, as humans with no uh, SRY, uh, the development becomes female, with it, it becomes male. Disrupting the system. And this is where some of the experiments get kind of interesting. If you take that uh, determinant, the SRY, move it uh, to the X chromosome. So in other words, um, it's an animal with the uh, two X chromosomes and an SRY attached, and then it becomes male. So this is a, sort of a, a dominant characteristic. Um, you can either add an extra Y chromosome to, you can also add an X, X, extra Y chromosome to an XX. It's kind of like Feinfelter syndrome um, and uh, becomes male. Uh, if, the, on the other hand, if the SRY area is deleted in a male, it leads to a female phenotype. Again, sort of proving that this is how to determine sexuality. However, we have a problem that the SRY gene is actually not expressed in the brain at all. So it shouldn't affect directly the brain in as deep a way. Other determinants include hormones, estrogen or septine beta estradiol, testosterone. Uh, both of these are synthesized through the, sort of the same pathway, um, and that has some consequences in that if you disrupt the pathway some, you end up with the sort of the last branch point in terms of hormones. Um, they are lipophilic, so they're and they are present throughout most of the body. This is a problem during pregnancy if you think about it, because um, being present through the entire body. It's going to be present in mom, particularly estrogen is going to be present in mom, and the baby would be swamped with estrogen. So uh, alpha fetal protein is actually the sort of the sponge or the buffer that takes that out of the baby circulation, and the baby doesn't get exposed to uh, high levels of estrogen during pregnancy. 
there is a testosterone surge during pregnancy for the baby, and that one is not buffered, but it only happens in young babies. Um, and again, since the default tends to be to develop into female, this, the system supports. Here's a, just a diagram showing some of the areas where the um, everything's acting. This is at the uh, presynaptic cleft and postsynaptic cleft. There's receptors in there for steroids. They're then transported back to the nucleus where they do their, their activity. The bottom part of the diagram is the rat brain showing areas where there's estrogen receptors, essentially. Uh, a lot in the uh, sort of the uh, midline structures. Post, this would be close to the hippocampus, on um, several hippocampus, the thalamic areas. So kind of crucial for uh, pituitary function. Okay, dimorphism is present in the rat. There's a specific dimorphism that has been sort of doc well documented. The, there's a spinal nerve. Uh, a spinal nucleus and spinal cord for the bulbal cavernosis. And this is uh, expressed in males. It is generally atrophic in females. The nucleus um, innervates the bulbal cavernosus and the levator ani, and these are both muscles present also in females. It's just that they're much more prominent in the male. Um, in the female with uh, without any exposure to testosterone, the muscles themselves uh, tend to atrophy some, and that results in what has been basically a target dependent trophic effect, and the nerve cells in the spinal cord atrophy. Uh, you can rescue the females with supplemental testosterone from the rat. Interesting. This is uh, really hard to see, but basically, this side is the male with presence of muscles and presence of the nucleus. And sort of, there's actually two of them, one right there and one right there. Uh, in the female, the muscles eventually become atrophic and the nucleus does disappear. All right, there's also brain changes depending upon the sex. Um, a lot of these happen in the preoptic area. Um, and this is again like a rat, a lot of experiments have done in the rat. Uh, the preoptic area is much more developed in the male. And, but it's not absent in the female. And actually that area is involved in sexual behaviors during intercourse with, with uh, both sexes. So both are firing off at different phases of sexual activity. Um, but the activity for the male and the female is obviously different. Uh, and the timing of releases of hormones is also different. This is to try to show some of that. This I think is the the female's level of firing from these nerves in the supraoptic nucleus. And this is the male who has a lot of activity until, um, let's see, this is, this is a courtship type thing. And this is actually mating and then the ejaculation occurs right there. And then uh, I guess it's kind of safe or something like that. <laughs> the female has much more um, repetitive uh, firing from the area. So these are like, Studies. And the actual nucleus is right here. I believe this is the male. This is the male. This is the male. This is the male. Okay, structural changes in parenting. So there's a couple of other uh, hypothalamic nuclei that are involved for lactation, PVM and the superoptic nucleus. Now, interestingly, these two nuclei are right next to each other. And until the mom actually has a baby to uh, to suckle. Um, there's the the cells are still separate. There's a signal that goes out either by pheromones or by hormones, uh, where the cells, because they're right next to each other, just for a little bit of glial process between. The glial process disappears, the two cells fuse and join these gap junctions. Gap junctions are really fast communications and electrical junctions between the cells, and so suddenly you've got sort of a conjoined electrical unit that suddenly can produce a whole bunch of oxytocin um, and, and prolactin. So um, that's the mechanism that's actually happening at the time of sort of initiation of, of uh, feeding for the baby. Yeah, and once they're fused, I think they stay fused, but uh, I think the activity goes down. Yeah. This is to show the actual fusion uh, sort of. Or the glial process between the cells and then the 
it's not. <clears throat> the oxytocin surge that happens with you. Okay, branching and sprouting. So the nerve processes uh, of different nerve cell types have been noted to be affected by sex hormones, particularly progesterone, estrogen, and to some extent by testosterone. Um, so there's some experiments that look at this. This is actually a uh, treat, treatment with uh, progesterone to create a, a vast arborization in an area that didn't have much. Uh, this one, go back. Uh, this is with um, looking at dendritic spine density in these nerve projections. And it's very high if you add supplemental progesterone or estrogen. This is actually normal. I mean, this is with some antagonist receptor, and the, the, the sort of the fuzziness of the line gets a lot less. The branching is getting less. On the bottom part, we have an experiment with testosterone, where we add testosterone and we get a whole bunch of sprouting. We don't add the testosterone, we don't get as much of it. This is from the uh, spinal nerve cell. Okay, intersexuality. So, this is a phenomenon that. Uh, that we talked about a bit in sort of the textbook we've been using for class. Um, it's where there's some uh, variance in terms of the actual phenotype or genotype and or between the two. So Turner syndrome is an example of somebody who uh, has sort of a, re a reduced complement of X chromosomes, XO. They're small in stature, they're really, really rudimentary genitalia. And this is in part because of sort of a lack of full complement of, of hormonal stimulus. They had two X, if it was XX, yeah, that's XX. Yeah. Uh, then that turns out to be the phenotype, sort of a, um, a asexual state almost. Um, recall here that one of the X chromosomes is usually inactivated, and so if you have only one, and you're selectively inactivating that half the time, then you fall more fully inactivated, depending on how, how it was, uh, might, uh, which X we are. Prime filters uh, is XXY. So with that Y added in, the, the patients with this uh, do have male, male genitalia, but they have some female phenotype because of the double X. And then XYY looks very normal. Uh, there's, there were some studies that I remember hearing about in medical school about uh, wondering whether there was some hypercriminality and things like that with extra Y chromosomes. That didn't come out. It was not actually reproducible data. So um, fairly normal. Uh, the extra Y doesn't seem to make any difference. Um, there's some Variations here that are more at the gene level. Congenital uh, adrenal hyperplasia is a disorder where basically the adrenal glands are cranking out testosterone instead of converting some of it to uh, mineral corticoids like aldosterone. And um, as a result, you get somebody who, as if it's a male, they're very tall, have very early puberty because of all the extra testosterone. If it's a female, they'll be part of the masculine and that includes behaviors. So, for instance, sexual preference might be masculinized. The uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome is usually due to deficient 5 alpha reductase, which is an androgen pathway. And uh, because of this deficiency, testosterone isn't really uh, produced. Early in life, it's produced later in life, but not early in life. But there's no prenatal surge, which is part of the differentiation of males. So the genitalia and phenotype tend to be female at birth, but then later in life, there is a surge for testosterone, which is another way of making it. And they become male at around 12 for puberty. So uh, it, this was, uh, I think, the, the name of the group of patients in Hindi was. Uh, Testes of 12, they have a, a sort of a, a name for the phenomenon as a, um, a family, a large family over there. Um, interesting because the, the, fortunately for this, these patients, 
the, they are uh, sort of identifying as males often, but and they eventually become males. So there's sort of uh, that, that kind of works. Uh, it's not always the case. So for, with, uh, with the masculinized females here, it's a problem you know, in the sense that they are actually female, but they're, they're feeling as if they're males. The sexual orientation. Um, this again is a sort of a step in, to the side and a bit more uh, difficult to sort of analyze scientifically at this point. But there's a little bit of data in animal models in Drosophila. Um, there's a gene called fruitless, which is present both in males and in females, and it determines sexual behavior. And generally, the presence of one type of the gene um, generates male type behaviors. Um, and then the presence of an alternate copy of the gene, alternate version of the gene, generates more female type behaviors. Absence of the male also does that. Um, the, the gene is necessary for normal male mating behavior, and uh, it's spliced different between male and female. So it's a little variant. It's a little hard to see. So this is the the uh, sort of the genotype, the, the, the gene actually in the chromosome with introns that are spliced out. And then depending on how it's spliced, it becomes either a female version or a male version. And then over here, you can sort of see the effects of this. This is a, the, a measure of sort of sexual activity in terms of what the apparent preference of the animal is. This is a female and male, uh, Sorry. Normal male is the blue, and then we have a mutant um, male with sort of a uh, split uh, gene. The one's is half mutant and half not, half null. And then this one is uh, mutant with a null on the other side. So there's basically, there's no good gene or goodness for this particular set of atoms. So they, they have to exhibit more female. Behavior. So going beyond fruit flies, this is to try to tease apart some of the differences in the anatomy of the human brain. Um, and um, what you see in green is areas that are typically more developed in females and blue areas that are a bit more developed in males. There are targets for a lot of the uh, testosterone and the uh, estrogen in the brain, but they're pretty widely distributed. I'm still teasing this, this one part. I don't think we quite got to the point where we draw solid conclusions. Um, okay, so in conclusion, there's a lot of things interacting here. We have the genotype, which is the chromosomal complement. Is the genes that make them up, phenotype, what's actually seen, um, and then the hormones are at play on, underneath the surface. There's splicing variants. Um, this is an example I didn't put up slides for of maternal behaviors in rats where there's a gene that, uh, if present, the mother tends to be. Uh, a, very attentive and make take measures to sort of make it easier for the pups to feed um, and take very good care of the of the pups, cleaning them very quickly, rapidly, and all that. And there's some behavioral measures of this. The pups of these mothers exhibit the same properties. And it doesn't matter if the pups are adopted from another mother or the, the mother's own offspring. And there's actually an imprinting phenomenon going on where the uh, the gene is being methylated and uh, by the activity. Uh, so this gets passed on to the next generation as imprinting, modifying the gene. Um, it was interesting. Uh, there was also a splice variant on that particular gene. Um, the copy number of genes can uh, potentially also have some role in some of these uh, differentiations. And then masking of genes, we really have an example of that. But um, if a gene was inactive or if it were methylated and not, not being expressed, that would be an example of masking. Very complicated to try to tease apart, but actually, it's, I mean, it's kind of interesting because 
way back when I was doing some work on gene splicing. Okay, let's go on lecture. Um, we could try to get a little bit of memory or, or not. It's up to you. How tired are you? <laughs> well, hungry, though, right? You're hungry? <laughs> well, okay, then why don't you? Yeah, so you haven't had a chance to eat. I could send it around. Is it long? I don't know if it's really short. No, uh, it's probably about 20 minutes, 22, 30 minutes. Why don't you get something? I'll send it out to you right now. <clears throat> What do you, uh, what do you uh, should say about even then we can go to lecture? So you didn't see anything on that, guys? Did you? Did you uh, no. When I saw the normal, I saw yeah, the yeah, no, no, I, I didn't. Uh, I still have to go over the last uh, four hours, five hours. But um, yeah, he was it was hard to, to sort of keep control of him down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, yeah, family history sounds more like stress. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. And I'm uh, I'm hoping that's all he has. But I, it's a little weird. We were like he was leaving, and we were in. We went in together, right? Yeah. And he said, you know, oh yeah, everybody everybody's having seizures, but they don't count. It's yeah. like, well. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I can send Jen one off. Thank you. Do you want to send this one too? Um, I mean, have it on video, but if you want to send it, yeah, that'd be great. Don't you did the first part, right? Uh, I think he did the actual uh, response or sexual responses. Right. Yeah. I think I did it once to much, much hilarious. <laughs> Or do I need to turn anything off in terms of the? Um, you can just close. Actually, we've been just shutting off the computer. Oh, We're okay. doing okay. Yeah, I think right. should be fine. Yeah, so. Okay. You too. Thank you.